Hello there everybody. I am Chef Laura Bonicelli of the Bonicelli Cooking Club. Welcome! This is a Minneapolis Farmers Market live cooking demo in partnership with the Bonicelli Cooking Club. Hashtag Bonicelli Cooks the Market. So tonight, as I said, we are making rhubarb cardamom scones and rhubarb ginger marmalade. I talked a little bit about rhubarb last week, but that was last week. So briefly, let me tell you again a little bit about rhubarb. Rhubarb is a vegetable, although um, most people use it like and think of it as a fruit. It's incredibly tart. Therefore, it lends itself well to sugar and lots of it. So like strawberries, which it's often paired with, it, its cooked consistency makes a really great jam or marmalade, which is what we're doing today. Rhubarb resembles celery and chard, although it's not related to either one of those, and its leaves are poisonous. This is the part I really wanted to bring up. The leaves contain oxalic acid, as do broccoli, spinach, asparagus, and other vegetables, but in rhubarb leaves, the oxalic acid is highly concentrated and therefore it is dangerous. So consuming a small amount won't kill you, but it can make you sick. So don't eat the leaves. Now cardamom, cardamom, oh, most of the cardamom sold is so good. <laughs> sold in the world is ground. And that's kind of a shame because the spicy, slightly sweet, distinctive flavor is so much more prevalent when you grind the seeds of the pod yourself. Green cardamom pods are what's typically sold in stores and I always buy cardamom in small amounts because the pods dry out really quickly and they lose their potency. Cardamom is very common in Scandinavian cooking and baking, typically used in breads. Cardamom like cinnamon and nutmeg and cloves tricks your brain into thinking that the dish it's in has sugar, even if it doesn't. So the next time you smell one of those spices, cardamom, cinnamon, cinnamon, um, Think about that. It's tricking your brain into smelling sweetness. It's true. <laughs> so we're gonna start with our scones and my oven is preheated to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so let me just move that. So what I have here already measured out is my flour. It's a cup and a quarter each of whole wheat flour and all purpose flour. You can see the two are in there right there. And I'm gonna add to that a half a cup of sugar I always get questions about this. This is an organic sugar, so it has a kind of brown color. It's a little more granular than white, regular sugar. I buy it at Costco. Um, really love it. It dissolves just like regular sugar, and I use it in everything. So that is what that is. It's not a special kind of um, odd sugar. It's, it's an all-purpose sugar. It just doesn't have, um, it's just a little bit on the brown side. So let's set that over there. Okay, and then to that I'm adding a tablespoon of baking powder. And then, this is my cardamom, a teaspoon of ground cardamom and a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. And I always use kosher salt in everything unless I'm finishing something off with the sea salt. So, um, even in baking. So let's just stir all of these together. And these are my dry ingredients. So this is a very typical process of getting all your dry ingredients together, making sure they're well blended, and then we'll worry about um, the, the wet ingredients and getting those together in a second. But let's make sure we've really got this done. Then I'm going to be adding in a half a cup of chilled unsalted butter. And this is the part where I'm going to put some gloves on. I don't know if I've ever made it through a cooking video without wearing gloves. <laughs> you know, once you, once you work in a commercial kitchen and you get used to, you have to wear gloves for so many things, um, then it just becomes a habit. So I go through a lot of them. So this is chilled, cut in little cubes, a half a cup, unsalted butter. And you can use a pastry blender for this. I don't because the butter just gets caught in it anyway. I just use my hands. I'm just going to just work this in and this is going to take a couple of minutes. It's nice and cold so it's not going to get greasy and that's important. That's the reason it needs to be chilled. But we do want to work it through pretty well. That being said, it doesn't have to be um, completely incorporated. It can be a kind of a mealy texture but I do want to make sure that I get through all of the flour mixture 
just really important to get all of this mixed up really well, and I'll tell you why, because once we put it together, there's not going to be a lot of kneading. We're going to do a few turns with this and cut, cut the, um, the scones into shape. So you really want to make sure that these steps are done properly. And with such, you know, these scones and biscuits are such simple recipes, but there are a few little rules that you have to adhere to that make them turn out better. And really, even though we've got a tablespoon of baking powder in here, some of these pockets of butter are going to assist in the raising of the biscuit or scone. I and mean, really what a scone is is a, a sweet biscuit, basically. It's the same kind of ratio, just like you mix the dry, the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients. Okay, I'm just do a little bit more. This is my final, my final technique here of getting it all mixed in. And you'll notice this is still very dry. Nothing is melting here. It's not greasy in any way. That's because of my chilled butter. That's why that is important. If I had room temperature butter, we would be looking at a batter. It would look completely, completely different than this. So make sure that it comes right out of the refrigerator. I usually cut it and then put it back in the fridge so I don't have to worry about it. And then it comes out completely chilled. Okay, that looks really good to me. Okay, and then I've got, not taking these gloves off yet, this is a cup and a half, I think, right? Cup and a half? Hard to tell with this. Cup and three quarters. Cup and three quarters, okay. Cup and three quarters of chopped rhubarb. So we've been working on so many rhubarb recipes, and I actually have rhubarb from a friend, um, actually a friend's mother, via the friend. That's Blanche's rhubarb. My friend Jean brought the plants. Well, actually, we went and got the plants together. And anyway, it's, it's very, very healthy. And um, so I've never been able to use all of it until this year because we have been testing cakes and um, haven't done any pies yet, but probably we'll do a galette. I've been working on a dressing. We, oh my goodness, we did a pasta. So um, all the testing takes so much time and so much rhubarb. So that's what we've been doing. And um, so I actually had to go to the farmer's market and get some rhubarb from them to do this because I've, I've kind of decimated my backyard. But it's growing back already. I mean, this stuff is just so prolific. Okay, so here we have um, three quarters of a cup of heavy cream. And I've got a little bowl here for my egg. I'm gonna crack my egg into the bowl. And we know why I do that, because I do not like fishing eggshells out of batter. <laughs> it's really hard to do. I'm gonna just take my egg and dump it into my cream because I'm gonna just kind of mix this up ahead of time. And then I have a teaspoon of vanilla. And that's going to give this a nice vanilla-y background flavor, which definitely does. Okay, and let's just stir that up again. I'm getting a head start here because, again, once I put this in, I'm not going to work this batter in a whole lot, so I want to make sure this is all mixed up. Okay, let's do that and right into the middle of that. Okay. Now let's just mix this up. And just keep mixing until it gets there. And I'll probably put gloves on again in a second here. I suppose I could have just kept on that pair, but I didn't think of that at the time. Okay, I'm going to move this right here, and I'm just going to grab a little flour. You notice my flour is right here. I try to keep it very handy because then I don't have to walk across the room to get it. Okay, there we go. I'm just going to spread this around just a little bit there. Good. Okay, back with gloves. So let's just finish mixing this up, just whoops, incorporating 
all those liquid ingredients into the dry. Oops, there we go. Okay. Get that up there. Can you see that better? There yeah. we go. Okay. Almost there. And then what I'm going to do is just kind of form this into a ball. Still a little bit of dry ingredients on the bottom, so I'm just scraping those in and working them in. And just like a biscuit, you don't really have to worry about anything other than making sure that your dry ingredients come in contact with your wet ingredients and they get moistened. Other than that, we're not trying to activate any gluten here. We're using a chemical leavener, which is the baking powder. So chemical leaveners react to the moisture and we're not trying to activate the gluten, we're just trying to get this mixed up and I think we've done it. Okay, let's put this over here. Then on my floured surface, so I'm going to give this a couple of turns. So I'm pressing it out and I just turn it on top of each other like that and press it out. Turn it again. And what this is going to do is just going to build some layers. So when this raises, we'll have some little layers built into it, which is just a nice thing to do with biscuits and scones. One more time. You can see that that rhubarb is pretty chunky, and I'm good with that. <laughs> so the way I cut it up, um, I had used pretty thin stalks. And rhubarb is interesting in that within the same plant you can get some very thick stalks and thin stalks, so it really doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with um, you know how long it's been growing. There's a variety, or at least my rhubarb has a variety. What I bought at the market too, so thin and thick. The thicker ones I split down the middle lengthwise so that they would be roughly the same size. And then I just cut the whole stalk into half inch slices. And that so half inch slices which is pretty big and then I'm going for an eight inch circle here and I've got my little ruler I like um, scones to be fairly high could if you wanted them to be a little flatter you could flatten it out a little bit if you wanted to and then I've got a baking sheet that is covered with parchment paper right here. Now I like to use, let's get rid of that, a bench knife to cut the scones. And that's this. And I always spray it just a little bit of cooking spray. Oops. Like that. Did you notice that I put, I put that right in front of that camera? I moved it. Okay, so then we're going to cut this into quarters first, like that. And then we're going to cut each quarter in half. And this bench knife is probably the one I use the most. It actually has a, a blade-like edge to it. It also has um, measurements on it, so it comes in really handy. Particularly though, I use it less for measuring, but I use that blade a lot more than I ever thought I would when I bought it. Okay, then these just go, and anything that falls out, like a piece of rhubarb falls out, just put it right back in. Okay. Go like that. This is hanging together very well, I think. And if you alternate them like this on your pan, and fit them all in rather nicely and kind of work together just kind of switch the direction on them so that they look like that okay let me just put this aside okay then the last thing we're going to do here is put a little 
sparkle sugar on top. Could just use regular sugar if you wanted to, but this just has a little bit of sparkle to it and it's a little bit bigger. It's a clear sugar. Sell all kinds of brands. As a matter of fact, on my, on my blog post on this, I put a link to Amazon. And it's one of those things where you can pay $20 for a jar or you can pay $3 for a jar. A lot of different brands out there. And I'm not doing anything with um, any milk or egg or anything on top of this. This will, I just pat these down just a little bit to make sure the sugar stays and that's all I do. And it does stay like that. Okay, are you ready to send a, or set a timer for me, Mark? Sure. So I am going to set, I am going to have Mark set a timer for me for 10 minutes because I want to turn the pan. My oven is not all, it's a great oven. It's an old oven, great oven, but it's not particularly even. So I always make sure that I turn pans around so that things bake evenly. So 10 minutes and it goes. All right, let me clean up here for a second. Are there any questions that came in or that you have? We have got some in today. I don't have anything right here yet. Okay. Oh, here are the ones for, here, let me hand these to you. These are the ones I got today. Um, what is double acting baking powder? And I'm not sure if you can hear Mark because we've moved our situation around here. So I'll repeat the question. So the question was, um, what is double acting baking powder? And that is mostly what you see now is double acting. I'm not sure um, exactly what year baking powder was invented, um, but as I said earlier, it's, um, it's a chemical leavener. And um, I know the early iterations were single acting baking powder, which meant that it would start to react to the liquid when you put, you know, added the liquid into your mixture like we just did. Then that starts that, that puffing, that raising. Um, double acting also reacts to the heat. So you get the first kick of, and you'll notice this when you're baking, um, if you're making biscuits or anything like that, if you let the dough sit for a little while, it'll start to raise once you add the liquid. That's because that's the baking powder already reacting. And um, so the second kick is when you put it in the oven, then it starts to raise because of the heat. So that's what double acting baking powder is. And most of what I see now is double acting baking powder. As a matter of fact, you, it's one of those things that I rarely even think about. That's just what we buy. Okay. But, well, if, if you have another question, I'm just going to get this in order here. No? Okay. What did you get? What you doing there? Yep. You just take me a second. We have a camera over here now, and I have to get used to not blocking it. <laughs> Am I doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Now rhubarb ginger marmalade so um, this calls for two pounds of rhubarb and i wanted to show you as much of the process that as i could so what i did was i started the um i, cut, I split the recipe in half so we're going to make half a recipe here get that part started and i already have um, the other half of the recipe macerating and i'll show you that in a few minutes so you can see what this is supposed to look like before you actually start to cook your marmalade but first let's let's cut up some rhubarb and this is um, this is from the farmers market so again we've got a lot of different sizes this is how I bought it and that's fine but I, what I do want to do is kind of get everything into similar sizes so I am going to split these fatter ones down the center and this is going to cook for probably at least an hour in order to turn it into the marmalade that I want. So um, I'm not terribly concerned about the sizes, but I do want to make sure that anything that is really, really large, like this guy, is split in half. And I think we'll do this one too. Right down the center. Great. And from there, let's do this half at a time. You can just line them up. And go 
going with about, again, it's about half inch pieces. I want some um, texture to my marmalade. So I'm fine with leaving these pieces at this size. Let's go those in. Again, this is going to be a pound. And line these up again. So when I pull the ones that I got, the rhubarb that I got out of my garden, the way that you harvest it is to just pull the stalk right out of the plant. Um, what my friend does, and we do sometimes, not all the time, is we take the take those leaves, those poisonous leaves, <laughs> and snap them off and then put them around the base of the plant. That's what she recommends and that keeps the weeds down. So that's a good, good use for those leaves so that you don't um, have to throw them away because you sure, sure can't eat them. Um, but it's amazing when you're, you're getting quite a bit of rhubarb how many leaves you wind up with. So that's a really good use for them. Then they can actually keep the weeds down and, and eventually they'll decay and feed the rhubarb plant. Okay, so there is that. And then two, so this is um, one pound pretend it's two, and then we have here, um, this is actually a quarter cup of chopped crystallized ginger, and a, the other quarter cup is in here, so we'll just add it in. Total would be a half a cup if we were making the whole recipe. Let's stir that guy in. And crystallized ginger, if you haven't seen that, I have some right here. I buy this at an Asian store. They sell it in bulk, so it's very inexpensive there. It's delicious it's like a candy um, and that's what it looks like so it's cooked in um, a simple syrup type of thing so sugar water basically and then rolled in sugar afterwards it's very spicy very hot very delicious okay so that's in there and then of course we have to add um, sugar and what happened to my sugar oh here it is okay so here's my sugar and this is two cups of sugar let's put that in And then we have to work on my lemons. So, zest of lemon. So I like to do this with the box grater. I already did one of them, so we're gonna do one of them. And here's the juice from that lemon right here. The thing about zesting a lemon is you wanna make sure that you get just the yellow part. You don't wanna go too deeply into the pith because the pith is really bitter so it the bitterness overtakes the lemoniness so you want to make sure that you just get the yellow part off and you'll get quite a bit of zest you'll see doing it that way it goes pretty quickly and I want the whole thing there is a lot of lemon in this recipe and the reason for that is there is no pectin in this recipe rhubarb has very little pectin in it so if I were going to make this without lemon I would have to use pectin in order to uh, get the get the jelly or marmalade to, to gel. So um, in lieu of that, we're using a lot of lemon. And what's curious about the lemon in this recipe is if you were to taste this, you know, as soon as we get this mixed up, you were to taste it, it would be very lemony, especially after you add the lemon juice when you're going to put it into the um, into the pan and simmer it down. But what happens is the rhubarb and the lemon kind of switch places. So after it's simmered and it turns, um, it gels, then the rhubarb becomes forward and the lemon is in the background and the ginger is just this kind of nice um, spice to it. And it goes perfectly with the scone. Um, so let's mix this up. I heard that camera click. What's going on? Oh, it just decided to stop for a while. Oh. Camera's tired. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, so this is mixed up, and this is what this looks like. Let's look at this now, because this is going to sit, and I think I say three to four hours. You can leave it as long as overnight if you want to, and it's going to macerate the fruit. The lemon juice, the sugar is going to work on that fruit, and what's going to happen is this. So this has been sitting for about three hours, and 
a tremendous amount of liquid has come out of that fruit mixed with the sugar. It's it, by volume is almost in half of what it was. This is my cooking juice for my um, for my marmalade. So this part of the process cannot be skipped. You have to do this, and um, this is and this is where you get the liquid. And we're going to add that lemon juice that I that I'm about to finish doing. We're going to add that in before we cook it. So there'll be even more liquid. Okay, where's my juicer? Here we go. I juice a lot of lemons, boy, I'll tell you. There's, I need a lemon tree. <laughs> Someone over there is rolling his eyes. <laughs> Again, the lemon tree. We live in Minnesota, we can't have a lemon tree. Well, I'm gonna give it a try anyway. Okay. Okay, that's a lot of lemon juice. And then let's strain that in with the other. Ah, okay. Hang on one second. I'm going to turn sure. this pan. Okay, set it for another eight minutes. Look how these are puffing up. Aren't they beautiful? Can you see them? Okay, turning the pan. All right, so straining my lemon juice. Okay, so this is gonna go in to all of this macerated fruit right before I put it on the stove. But of course we can't do that right now because this, this has another three hours to go. So can you show um, a picture of what this looks like when you first put it in the pan? So these will be combined. They're both going into the pan, and I think we have a photo of that. It's uh, coming up. Yeah. I can see, a, I have a screen above here so I can see what's up there. There it is. Okay, so you can see when it first goes into the pan, it's, it's very fresh looking still, very red like this. And all that liquid is coming from that fruit and a little bit of lemon juice that I added in. Okay, and then after it cooks for a while, it will darken down. And, um, and I, this batch I have back here, and remember you have to, after this happens, this is macerated, you're adding in all this lemon juice before you put it on the stove. And then do you have the next one of it, of it coming up here? Yeah, there you see how it darkens down. And that's probably right before, right before I turned off the heat. And this is, this is how thick this is. Look at how beautiful that is. So no pectin and we've got a really serious, beautiful marmalade here that you can jar up and do whatever you want with. You can can it. I did some here. Use it as refrigerator jam. It'll keep for quite a while in the fridge. And that is it. Okay, so what I'm... About, um, when it's hmm? done, you want to see the test? Oh, the test, yes. The, we, we did a shot of um, how to test it when it's done. And this is a great thing. Thank you for bringing that up. If you um, throw a couple of plates, maybe three, into your freezer, and then when you think it is done, take one of the plates out, take a teaspoon or so of, of your marmalade, It'll still be cooking. Put it on the plate, wait 10 seconds, and then run your finger through it. And if it does this, stays separate, then you know that your marmalade is done. That's the test. So it always takes me a couple of passes because I'm really anxious. I want it to be done because it smells so good. So, um, and I would start probably um, when you see it looking homogenous. In other words, when you see the fruit not so separated from the liquid, and if you're watching it cook, you'll know what I'm talking about. When it starts to kind of look like it's gelling up and it's thicker, that's when you start testing it. And um, that batch that I had right there was about an hour. That's how long it took. And then I cooled it down and put it in jars and um, had a scone. Right, okay. Did I miss any pictures? No? All good? Okay, more questions. Um, Colleen asked if you prefer cane sugar over sugar beet sugar. 
Mm, yeah, I probably do. I, cane sugar is what I use, and um, sugar beet sugar I haven't had in a long time. So yes, I use cane sugar most of the time, but great question. Um, uh, someone asked about pectin, but I think you already answered that. Um, what was the question? Uh, can you, you, could you use pectin in the marmalade? Oh, well, let me ask, the question is, can you use pectin in the marmalade? I, not in this marmalade, and that's because, you, <laughs> because you've already got all this, you've already got all this citrus in there that is going to add, it has a lot of pectin in it. So, but, um, and I would say that the ratio in this recipe is great because again, the flavor of that lemon is really a part of what makes this great. This is, it's lemony, it's gingery, so you want to make sure that you don't mess up that ratio. Um, that being said, if you get in trouble and you want to add some pectin because it's not setting up, you could do that. And I certainly have seen people, you know, try to fix things by adding usually liquid pect pectin in at the end if they're if they're not getting it to gel. But I've um, I've never had problems with this recipe, and um, honestly, there's a ton of pectin in citrus fruit. So, there you go. If you can the marmalade, how long would you process it? Oh, probably 10 minutes. 10 minutes is usually, is usually what I do for, you know, yeah. 10 minutes, I would say, and you'll, your jars will pop nicely. That's, I think that's that kind of the standard amount of time that you leave things in a water bath, and that's what I've always done. And you can see now, maybe you can't see, but this is starting already. It's all the sugar is, is definitely wet, and um, so the liquid is starting to come out. It doesn't look like this yet, but it's gonna get there pretty quickly. And I wouldn't start, I, you know, until that sugar is dissolved. So, you know, like that, that's when you know that you can start cooking your marmalade. Can you use regular ginger root for the marmalade instead of crystallized? Yeah, regular, yeah, I mean, um, so regular gin, or crystallized ginger is ginger that's sliced or diced or something, peeled, of course, and then it's cooked in a sugar solution, sugar water solution, and um, it changes. It becomes very candy-like, and sugar infuses it, so there is a difference, but um, I would say I would cut back on the amount if you wanted to do that, because bear in mind, you're also, if you use regular ginger, you're going to be cooking it for a long time in a lot of sugar. So I would say that that probably would work. I've never done it, but I'm, sh I'm sure it would work. There's, you know, the, there's enough sugar in here, you don't have to worry about adding more. I'm pretty sure about that. So give it a try. I might, like I said, I might back off, um, you know, cut the sugar back or the ginger back by half just to be on the safe side because it's gonna be more potent because it hasn't already been through a cooking process. So that's what I think on that. But I love ginger, so give it a shot. Okay, that's that's what you got? Time. Okay. How much more time do we have in the timer? Uh, we have uh, one minute. One minute. Eight out of eight, right? Okay. Yep. Okay, so there's usually 20 to 25 minutes. We might be a little bit early. But let's talk about tomorrow night while we've got a chance here. Um, tomorrow night we are doing a spring pea soup. This was a favorite from the restaurant. Um, we actually are not using spring peas. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it's a it's a lettuce based soup, and um, I generally use frozen peas for it. Uh, but it's very very spring like, and the color is fantastic. And um, so, oh wait a minute, I'm I jumped to next week. Next week tomorrow night is asparagus soup. Backing up, spring pea soup is next week. Asparagus soup is tomorrow night. That is not as bright of a green as the spring pea soup, but it's very, very beautiful. And we made the, the recipe for the shot with purple asparagus. And actually when you cook purple asparagus, it pretty much turns green, funny thing. So we blanch the tips really lightly and use that as a garnish. So that is tomorrow evening, that's a gorgeous soup. And with that, okay, give me one more minute here. It's fine, I'm comfortable. Um, we're serving a spring pea salad, and is that picture up somewhere around here? Can you put that up? I don't have it in the mix. Oh, it's not in the mix, okay. 
it's on the blog and it'll be up tomorrow morning. That is a gorgeous salad and that is um, served on a base of ricotta that's kind of smeared on the platter and that has lemon in it. It is really pretty. It also has chives and mint and dill and a lot of herbs. So the herbs are um, almost like a, a part of the, the well, they're like lettuce. We use them more like lettuce than herbs. And we're using some pea tendrils, which we were lucky enough to find. So yes, it's all happening at the market. I'm so excited about that. Okay, let's look at those scones before I burn them. Okay. So they're starting to brown. I'm gonna probably let them go for another two or three minutes. But look at how they're all puffed up and beautiful. And they smell fantastic. Cardamom is such a wonderful spice. And it's, like I said, right up there with cinnamon in terms of making you perceive that sweetness. And um, it's up there with nutmeg too. So back in the oven for probably another three minutes. Okay, and we'll wrap things up. Oops. Um got a question. Um, yes. Uh, how much of this do you put into your scones? I assume they're talking ginger. Um, how much was ginger went into the scones? There's no ginger in, in this scone. Oh, okay. So, um, th so I put, and that's an interesting question because well, I... Maybe, maybe they meant the, the, in the preserves. In the preserves, in the preserves, it's a half a cup. Uh, yes, half a cup of chopped crystallized ginger. I'd back down to, if you were going to try it with fresh, I'd use maybe a third of a cup of fresh ginger just, just because it's going to be more um, edgy or acrid. Um, it's sharp, sharper, so that's what I would do with that. But interesting that you would bring that up because I often add a couple of tablespoons of crystallized ginger into scone recipes. I do it at the last minute. So that's one of the reasons that I keep so much of it on hand. It's just a great thing to kind of slip in there. You don't have to change the ratio of anything. Um, just add it in and it adds just a wonderful depth of flavor and a bit of a surprise to any, anything. As a matter of fact, we do a, um, an apricot scone with jalapeno and ginger in it to die for. So um, yeah, so there's that. Good question. I have a question about uh, where we can get to your blog again. I'll put this, this up. Okay, my blog is bonicellicookingclub.com, and it's up, upper right-hand corner says blog, <laughs> and um, and the, if you scroll down, um, you can you know get to the recipes. They're kind of in order in there, and then um, and you can dig around in there and find whatever you want. There's a lot of recipes up there right now, and that that is the place where going forward I will post all of the recipes. Every recipe that we do here will have a blog post, so go and read the blog posts. I work very hard on them. Um, it gives you more information about ingredients and just kind of the history of um, you know my process of developing the recipe sometimes and we always have a pretty picture so you know what it looks like and the recipes are printable right off of there you can just download them and print them and have them to, you know wherever you want to keep them on your desktop or in printed version and you can also print the pictures so that's I think that people love that because they really want to know what things look like so we're making a big effort to show you in, in the recipe files. So bonicellicookingclub.com. Okay, anything else? Uh, that's all I see, yeah. Okay, I think we're having scones for dinner. How does that sound? Perfect. <laughs> Our diet is really weird around here. Anyway, tomorrow night, 5 p.m., and we are making, and I, I'm reading this right now, so I'm sure I have it right, spring pea ricotta salad and asparagus soup, both beautiful recipes. Um, thank you everyone so much. Thank you Minneapolis Farmers Market. Um, I love you and I'm really, really, really happy that we're in season now. Yay. So keep cooking everybody. Oh, there goes the timer. Take care. Ciao. Mwah.